You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. blow, 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 blow. Prepare to be astonished. Welcome to Headline This. I am Stephen Radford, your host, and this is the second special Halloween edition of the podcast, and we'll be talking to Denver Robbins about the film American Werewolf in London. Now, Denver is a film producer in Utah. He works for the Brute Squad, who turn out a tremendous amount of uh, film, commercials, music videos narrative films, you name it. Um, Denver is prolific in his work and uh, I, I never seem to see him... Can you hear that? Fireworks, everybody. The festivities have started. Do I, do I just continue? Do I carry on? I think I, just, I can just carry on over this. Now, the circumstance of getting Denver on the show to talk about this film is quite amazing because it, it, I, I wanted to talk about this film for a long time and uh, I've had many conversations in the past. It, it just seemed obvious that, that eventually I'd be doing a podcast about this film. It just turned out that Denver Robbins is a huge fan. The fact that his father worked in the industry and, and, and had a stint of working alongside Rick Baker in around about the same time that he, Rick Baker was working on on trying to figure out how to get a werewolf trans- transformation to happen there on the screen, and so it was the significance of this podcast is incredible, and the uh, the coincidence and the, uh, the the fact that we've we've actually done this this is perfect. I I, I cannot imagine talking about American Werewolf in London with anybody else, to be honest. And if you if you haven't seen it, then just go watch it. It 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 is an incredible. Um, it, it's a fun movie. It's not horrific. It's not terrifying. Uh, it is if you let it get to you. But it's it's uh, it, it's a comedy. Uh, deep down, it's a comedy, and um, yeah, it, it's it's something that I've revisited far too many times. I was I was surprised at the amount of things that Denver and I were able to pull out questions that had been left unanswered and even though some of it is speculation I think we've got a pretty good handle on the making of this film the few motifs that left us baffled (laughs) which we'll come to we don't want to uh, to put it all out right now in the intro we've got a lot to cover so time for a little stroll on the moors with Denver Robbins did you hear that I heard that. What was it? Could be a lot of things. Yeah? The coyote. There aren't any coyotes in England. The hound of the Baskervilles? Pecos Bill? Heathcliff. Heathcliff didn't howl. No, but he was on the moors. (laughs) It's a full moon. Beware Beware the the moon. moon. And stick to the road. Oops. So let's get Denver on the line. It's one of those insane things where you've got like 15 people called Denver. So it could be any of those. No, it's not that one. This could be a night of a, a thousand Denvers. Good evening. Knock, knock. <laughs> no, no, you're supposed to say knock, knock. I, I thought I did. <laughs> uh, how, ma- how many would have I gotten through before I got to you? That would have been quite amusing. And, and quite entertaining, yes. I, I, I never suspected there would be that many. Yeah. They're probably all old accounts of mine that I've forgotten about. That could be it. That, there's that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, it makes makes that whole vanity searching kind of interesting because uh, I, I, have you actually ever known anybody with your name? Or I, I've no, no, I've met a number of Denvers, certainly. Yes. Um, 
but no one with that name. Although there is there is a man with the last name of Robbins somewhere around who named his dog Denver, and for a time his dog had his own web page. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's uh, uh, yeah. So he, he, as as far as domains are, you're not too worried about that one. No, since I own DenverRobbins.com. Exactly. And I own <laughs> StephenRadford.com, and I know somebody who is StephenRadford.net who contacted me and said, uh, oh, so you're the one who's got my domain. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, well, uh, let's negotiate. So how are you, Denver? I'm, I'm doing great, you know, end of the weekend, kind of looking forward to what uh, the week holds for me. Well, you have a very creative job, and well, it, it holds a lot of lot of work, of course. But uh, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, an awful lot of work. We we leave town November the first, and between November the first, we do three different productions in three different cities, and mm -hmm. come back to Utah on the twenty first. So it'll be it'll be an interesting trip. So That's it'll be great. Seattle. It'll be Seattle. Washington, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and then Austin, Texas after that, and then back home. Wow. It sounds like you're some sort of comedian or something or somebody on the road, <laughs> a, a band. Um, mm -hmm. so, but, you, but you're not. You're, a, you're, you're, you're on the producing side of this, right? Right, right. You're not, you're not camera or AD or... No, I mean I'll do camera here and there because some, mm -hmm. of, those, some of those are going to be small crews and so I'll jump and do whatever job needs to be done. That's the way it needs to be, definitely. All right. So, uh, so how is your build up to Halloween going? Um, you know, it's been it's been interesting. We tried to do some party. We tried to do a party over the weekend. We just uh, spent some time um, in Salt Lake City, um, and so that's where we were the past couple of days. And um, kind of a yeah. bust. Not the not the best parties in in the world, but uh, we had a nice time just hanging out and getting away from the house for a while and. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean uh, are Halloween's kind of changing now that that I mean, all your 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 little ones are now grown up. Um, they're off oh, doing certainly. their own thing now, I guess. Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, we don't do, we, and and we live kind of in a in a weird part of town, and so we don't really get a lot of, you know, trick or treaters coming door to door, uh, mm -hmm. looking for candy, and so uh, Halloween night usually just ends up being. Movies and alcohol and that yeah, sounds perfect to, to me. Kids That's... go to their parties and yeah, yeah, and and if you can stay awake now, I mean, it gets to that stage where you're old enough to just because <laughs> uh, I remember having having marathons of at least three to five movies in a night. But I'm, oh, yeah. lucky, I'm lucky to get oh, through yeah. one. <laughs> like, that's what, and that's what New Year's looks like now. It's like, wow, yeah. is it already one, or is it? Can it please be one sooner? I want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it changes. It's a big change, but uh, at, at least you you still got the movie tradition right. You still mm, spend, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I'm I'm guessing that the productions that you are working on when you go to all these different cities, they're they're nothing to do with horror or Halloween or. Anything like that? No, no, no. Number one is apparel. Number two is healthcare, and number mm -hmm. three is firearms. So you know, I'm trying to cover the gamut, really. Is it commercials? Right. Is it commercials? Or? Yeah, it's all yeah. it's all commercial work. That's perfect. Do you uh, do you ever get to work on fiction or narrative at all? Oh yeah, yeah, we do quite a lot. Um, it ends up usually being crew and and uh, or camera and gear rental though that type of thing. But we have a small division in our company that is working towards uh, doing our own fiction, which is going to be fun if we can agree on a if we can agree on a a topic, <laughs> if we can agree on a story or a genre or something. That's like that. it. And, and I can imagine you're surrounded with people who hey hey uh, do you want to read this? Can you read that? You're surrounded by yeah. screenwriters, I imagine. Yeah, you know, it's surprising how much of that stuff just isn't good. Um, and they, bless their hearts, they love what they do, and I, and I commend them commend them for it. But uh, I've got some pretty strict standards when it comes to screenplays. <laughs> but you got to keep doing it. you got to keep doing it. That's right, because it's passion, right? It's love. You just keep going. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And uh, and Lauren, is, is she writing any more books? She is actually in the other room in her office writing right now. Uh, she's been writing, um, yeah, she's probably got, um, I don't know, three or four going on right now in tandem. That's incredible. And their follow-ups to, uh, Aeon, Aeon Star. 
Uh, one of them is, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And the other one, the other two, two or three are, yeah, not at all. Not at all. All separate. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough dividing your brain around different narratives at the same time. That's, <laughs> that's, that's something I can't do. I have to focus on one pure the whole time. She bounces back and forth, but she gets in she gets in this zone where she mm. can write and write and write and write, and the trick is to not uh, interrupt her. That's it. That happens, yeah. or you'll you, you risk losing a, an arm or a head or something like that. <laughs> that is exactly um, it. That is exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No one. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Now I, I've brought you on uh, on this. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, for actually wanting to come on and, and talk oh, about time, this film um american werewolf in london i'm guessing it's a shared passion between you and myself <laughs> and uh, i certainly love it i've always loved it and I, I can imagine it's for the same reasons um uh, perhaps well, how old were you when you first saw that movie oh quite quite young uh mm-hmm. goodness what year did that come out in it was 1980 80- yeah, eighty. So I would have been. 80, I saw it in eighty two, I believe, or eighty three, right around there. Yes, must have been eighty two. Uh, so I would have been eight years old. I think I beat you by two years. <laughs> I was six years old when I saw it. <laughs> wow. Which uh, wow. But, but it was an accidental viewing. Uh, well, it was, I say accidental. Was it? I <laughs> sorted it out. Was it? Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so you were eight years old. I'm, I'm guessing it wasn't your copy. Did you go and see it in the cinema? Or? No, so, you know, my, my father um, was a makeup artist. Oh, great. And, and so he he showed it to me. He sat me down and said, you have got to see this. <laughs> um, and... And you know he was he was right. I was yes. I was hooked. I was I was enamored by um, monster Nazis and rubber appliances. Mm. And I think it was probably, you know, I, I think I could safely say it was that movie and his prodding and, and not really understanding what he was doing prior to that um, yeah. that uh, set me on that path as as being a makeup artist for as long as I was. Absolutely, yeah. I can. I can... I think that's incredibly lucky to have that creative input at such an early age, and it's it's bound to make an effect on you, and a positive one as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, he showed me the the makeup and the prosthetics in an old copy. I, it had to have been like a Fangoria or something like yeah. that that he showed me the the photographs, uh, and then we sat down and watched it after that. That's that sounds so similar, except uh, I I did it covertly without my dad knowing about it. <laughs> Um, but I had this book called uh, Tricks of the Trade, and it had, um, it had the, the similar pictures of um, Jack in his um, – uh, it was in the various stages of, of decomposition. And nice. uh, the werewolf uh, transformation was described. I was, I was hooked on that book. I was hooked on the special effects that were, were presented in that. There were pictures of Rick, Rick Baker and various right. things in that. And I, an American Werewolf in London, I saw that title and thought, I know my dad has that in his video collection. So I think I snuck down one early morning and I watched it. Um, I think I fast forwarded <laughs> few, a few boring pieces, something about um, two people in a shower. Fast forwarded that, <laughs> not interested in that kind of, oh yeah. So it was all... And somewhere, you know, my dad did, did a little bit of training uh, with Rick Baker and somewhere no I got... Way. I got... Wow. Yeah, I'll have Sorry. to dig it up somewhere. A picture of my father and Rick Baker just prior they, – this, they were still in California. They were just prior to shipping out to London uh, with all of the prosthetics and stuff for American Werewolf in London. Yeah, because from my understanding, they actually worked on the prosthetics for six months before. Mm-hmm. And they hired the actors um, long before they actually um, had the budget for the film. Um, so that they can get the prosthetics done. They can get the full body cast for both – David and uh, Griffin. Right. And uh, he was actually, um, was Rick Baker working on The Howling before then? Ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. I think he uh, uh, Ooh, yeah, perhaps. Because I, I remember that there was uh, something to do with uh, um, being pulled off that project so we can work on something else. And I think that something else was American Wealth in London, but I'm not <laughs> so sure. Um, so your your dad worked with him around that time. Yeah, so my father was 
doing uh, makeup jobs here in Utah, mm -hmm. and he and a team flew out to uh, California to spend some time with Rick Baker to to help better what they were doing out here in Utah. Yeah. Because his his goal, I think he was he was handed that goal uh, by John Landis to come up with something that was different from what happened with the Lon Chaney transformations as a werewolf. He wanted it to happen on the screen and not there, not to be having any uh, dissolve cuts. Where, right, in the shadows. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and different body parts were just moving slightly uh, with each transformation because they were adding or, or, or removing. It, de it depends on whether they did it in reverse or not. Right, and that that technique that Rick Baker came up with was mm -hmm. used again in Michael Jackson's Thriller. The technique is the exact same one. Exactly. Uh, same and one. if you watch the transformations, they're they're nearly identical. And and it's it's to do with finding the right material that was uh, able to stretch with the mm -hmm. me mechanical element uh, and not break, but to also keep its and but to also keep keep its shape and form without actually bursting or ripping and popping and, yeah, and, yeah, exactly <laughs> and so so it was pretty much his uh his chemical formula that i'm guessing is it did he just... well it was foam it was foam latex, foam um, latex. That it was, yeah that was used and it's uh it's an interesting chemical well it's an interesting chemical reaction i mean you take basic you know latex mm -hmm. and you add a number of chemicals uh to it to cause it to harden well, let me back up. First, you add a foaming agent, and then you start to whip it, and you whip it, and you whip it like you're whipping cream into, you know, like a meringue, for example. Mm. And then you whip into that uh, another agent that uh, hardens it, but doesn't cause it to dry. It's called a gelling agent. Right. And, but it's still wet. It still has a lot of moisture in it. Um, and that is what ends up being placed into the molds, and then the molds are baked. Right. Um, low temperature for a long time. And uh, that takes all the moisture out. And then it's just this spongy, foamy, stretchy that moves great with your skin um, that is self-skinning, which means it creates a skin on the outside edge between uh, the, the, the edge of the mold. Uh, so it's not a foamy piece looking thing. It has a skin. Right. Um, and it's great stuff. And it's still used um, today for you know 90% of the prosthetics that you see. So it's get, kind of like the skin you'd get on a sausage so that you'd have the foam underneath and then that nice. Right. Okay. So, yeah, right. that's that's excellent. Um, wow. Do you know what? I, I wanted to write that down right then because I'm thinking that would be so <laughs> much fun to try. Um, it is. It's a trick to – it's really a trick to, to master – foam latex it takes quite mm. some time before you get pieces that you're really happy with because you can't you can't leave it in the oven for too little of time or too long of time and you, know, you gotta yeah. get the, the the bubbles just right they have to be refined to the right size it really is an art form and you know in big companies like rick baker and others there are jobs who are just foam techs that's all they do they have just yeah. mastered the process of foaming uh latex and that's all they do wow and, and it's it's a science. It sounds like it's it's an incredible thing, and and, it, and you just see little glimpses of it. Um, every cut, it's such a, a small fragment of of time on the screen, and right. the amount of time that they spent to actually get it all together, to get it all in shot. And That's one of the reasons I love that movie. Yeah. It's, it's gosh, it's so much like. Uh, Jaws, for example, you mm -hmm. just don't ever really see the creature. You don't ever really see. I mean, the first time you really, to me at least, the first time you really see the wolf in all its uh, coolness is when it is walking up on the platform of the tube. That's it. And the guy is laying on his back and and, and going up the elevator. If, if you watch, you can actually see, because that, that rig is like a cart, right? So you yes. push it out on wheels, and then it's got animatronics and stuff to move it. But if Moving you watch down. that scene, you can see the guys walking behind the the wolf as it comes out in view. Oh no! Oh, yeah. you Maybe. can see their feet. It's funny. Oh, do you know what? I'm going to have to watch it again now because um, uh, I re remember that scene so much. Because the underground, I think the London Underground is one heck of an amazing location to shoot, oh, and yeah. I'm, I'm amazed that they actually got that angle really because it's it's all caves and tunnels. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, to to be in there alone, because uh, I've only ever been in there when it's packed. It's uh, it's an astonishing view, and I love that love that scene. And I love the depth. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to fathom until you've gone down in there. But 
the depth of those things is astonishing. Definitely. And I love that view, just kind of down the escalators, and you, you can see the arcway there, and that creature just slowly comes out into. Oh, I love it! It was such a great shot. <laughs> those those escalators, they're they're the they're really tall because the subway in in London is is a lot deeper than say the one in New York City, where um, right. apparently it's, it's not as subterranean as, as London. Um, and because you just go on and on and on on those escalators, and it's it, you, it's amazing how deep those tunnels go. <laughs> Um, yeah. It's astonishing, and I think it, it, it's it's a kind of a underused um, location. I think um, in London, I, I, mm. I, you don't see it being used a lot. Uh, That's true, and I think it's probably because it's just so hard to to get permits and to clear it out and to have it, you know, free at, at certain times, and it's it's always yeah being used for maintenance. So. Um, that's why you, you know, that's why you film at like 3 a.m. or yeah. 4 a.m. When you would assume no one's going to be there. Exactly. And then, um, but is that what you, you do as well? Do you do any 3 a.m. shoots or is, is it pretty much? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All the time. Um, we just did four days, all night shoots. Uh, call time was 5 p.m. And we ended up wrapping usually between, well, we wrapped at 4 a.m. was our heart out because I was, because I'm, I'm a good producer. I like to get people home. And, but yeah, it was 4 a.m. So we were shooting all through the night. It was a, an alley scene um, for an energy drink uh, commercial. And I, and we had trailers there. So I just ended up sleeping on set. And then waking up, it's no, there's nothing like sleeping in a busy street in the middle of the city in a trailer. <laughs> Do you know what? Yeah, it's yeah, it's like sleeping in an airport at night. It's it's an, a strange experience. Um, yeah, I've done that many times, but uh, yeah, I, I, I just love that idea, especially for an energy drink. You guys probably would, needed the product, you know. Oh yeah, to keep you going. But uh, I, I I I love the set because you share a lot of what you do in your sets and, and you share a lot of that um, which is great because it's so inspiring to just see that you're working see you carrying on and that the, prof the level of professionalism is astonishing um you know right. we, we need some more of that over here we need to get some uh, <laughs> <laughs> some studios around here doing a, l a little bit more um but yeah back to uh, american werewolf so uh, it was an impressionable young age that we both saw it, and, and I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you had such a similar experience, albeit yours being a lot more connected to uh, that father and son relationship. Did did your father kind of protege you into into the makeup in this, in, into the makeup field, or did you just oh, yeah. take that off in, into your own direction? Um, you know, a little of both. I, I spent many many nights uh, with him in his studio. Uh, playing around with molding clays and, and latex. Mm -hmm. And I had this, uh, I don't know why I had it, but I don't know if you're familiar with Mork and Mindy, the, the television show with Robin Williams. Yes, and very much. I had this, I had this Mork doll, right? It was like a Ken doll, but it was Mork. <laughs> and, and I would use it to, to sculpt these creatures. I'd pose it in these, you know, weird shapes and I'd use clay to sculpt it in these bipedal creatures. It was, <laughs> I was a Great. weird kid. <laughs> no, that's that sounds. I mean, because you'd make a whole body cast of Robin Williams, in, in, well, right? <laughs> I guess, but they, they probably didn't look as much like Robin Williams in in, in those days with those models. Those <laughs> no, just the head. That's all. just the head. Yeah, <laughs> slight resemblance. But then I, you know, I went off. I went off and did. You know, he got out of it uh, after mm. a while, and I just continued on up until I got out of makeup in 1995. Uh, right around there, decided to become a producer. But was that um, was there a reason why you wanted to? Was it was it just a, a, a hunger to do something else? Um, it was well, it was twofold. the 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 reason I was looking to do something else is because the chemicals were honestly making me ill. Oh. Um, and because there's a lot mm -hmm. of ammonias and a lot of you know caustic chemicals that you end up working with, uh, the reason kind of I went to white kind of uh, thing going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just bad. They're just caustic stuff sometimes, yeah. and, and you got to be careful. Um, and, and I decided to be, become a producer because those were the people who were hiring me at the time, and so mm. I thought, well, that sounds like fun. I'll, I'll learn how to how to do that. But I, I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's that's great because it's it's just under, it's just trying to understand how 
um, makeup and and the, the the kind of practical effects that were going on in 1995, things were starting to take that shift into into digital mm. CGI. A bit, yeah. And of course, there was yeah, the the, the follow up to American Wealth in London was uh, um, American Wealth in Paris. Yeah, I mean that's kind of like that's kind of like bringing up Halloween three. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, but by what I what I mean is is that that the whole um, CGI uh, back in uh, I think it was probably nineteen ninety two ninety three it was like sure, when Alien sure. three came out as well. They thought they had it. They thought they had a chance to just go for it, and and it never looked the same. It never captured that yeah, feeling. There's, there's something about rubber masks mm -hmm. that that embody a, a soul you know if you do it right that that performance of the yeah. of the puppeteer or the person that is wearing the mask comes through and gives those characters soul and i just i've not well, i take it back i have seen it once but i've not very often seen a cg character with that kind of soul to it uh the first time i saw davy jones however I, I was convinced. I thought that's pretty darn good. I they did a fantastic job in embodying uh, Bill Nye's uh, performance in that. And I just I'm still a huge fan of the rubber mask and yes. I'm a huge fan of the puppets. They just I, they they look better to me. And and so I think since the, the Star Wars prequels, of, um, there's been a kind of a big rejection of CGI. Well, not a huge rejection, but there's been more of a lean to where it seems to be a pride of place that people use practical effects or that they actually are using puppets. Um, do you think then that might be another revolution for that? Do you think there'll be another American Werewolf in London um, revolution, maybe, or is it is it uh, is, is yeah. that gone now? Do you think? Yeah, no. There, I mean, there is. There's always. There's always the purists, the ones who would much prefer to see it that way. But we, we're the yeah. filmmakers. Um, we are the ones who are already in the industry. I'm not sure about the audience. I'm not sure if if standard audiences criticize as, as much as those who are in it do. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it's an art form, and we we just we just love it. So you keep doing it. it. I I I you know having the opportunity to use special effects makeup and and things like that in my career, um, it's something I'd want to bring into one of my own productions. I don't know that I could ever do CG. I mean, there is a fine line, right? There's there's certainly there's certainly a uh, a line in which you just can't do it with puppets. You just can't do it with masks anymore. That's right. Um, you you reach a limit of the technology, right? That's true. And you have to, that's true. you have to go to CG. That's very true. And but I, I think when when with American Wealth in London, that there was no need to ever imagine that in any, in any other way because it was practically happening to a person. Um, right. That and kind it was, of thing. It was. I, there's something about this show because it's almost an anti horror film. Horror film. I mean, when yeah. you think about it, there's really only three scenes in which. There's like carnage, right? There's the first one at the very beginning when they're walking through the moors. Yes. There's the first time he transforms and the second time he transforms. That's it. That's it. And then all that is in between is is the uh, the psychological uh, underpinnings of trying to figure out what what he's got to do as a werewolf and uh, the encounters with Jack, which are kind of more dramatic, more psychological. Oh, sure. And funny, Jack. And with funny. The he's, uh, but those two <laughs> actors, uh, it's an, an amazing uh, combination. The chemistry between those two was was yeah. so good. Um, hurting my feelings, Jack. And and the, so the wobbly, funny. the wobbly little bit of of, of uh, skin that was just flaking off the side of of Griffin's <laughs> face. And and right. I remember, I think David Norton said in an interview that he was so focused on that little bit of flappy skin that he he kept on forgetting his lines or he kept on losing his concentration because it was, it was just the makeup was just just looking uh, at it looking at him and wobbling and in, in, right in his face and and it, yeah it was um the, I, I think once you get into that bodysuit as well it's like when you see all these actors getting into all these little dotted uh cgi costumes that look like Mm -hmm. weird weird disease motion trackers, motion trackers that they kind of look diseased creatures <laughs> i don't know um but <laughs> the, the, the suit that yeah. made andy circus famous right exactly i mean i mean how <laughs> how can you relate to a character like that i mean the character of uh, that jack uh, uh decomposing he mm. was totally in that skin and uh, and you can see that there was the, the sense of humor that came across it it was it was double-edged 
It was kind of yeah, like a, there was a deep sarcasm with it because he was literally just sitting there talking with with his face peeling off, and and that's just gorgeous, gorgeous. Can I, I still, it, I still don't understand the scene with mm-hmm. his parents and his uh, kid brother and sister and the and the Nazi. Um, I don't, I don't, I just, I mean, it was a dream, right? But what was the motivation behind the dream? All the other dreams in some way related? Yeah, I, I, I there it is. It's like a dream, and I guess you've got to in, interpret it like a dream. Um, sure. That maybe there was a, a deep symbolism is that he was turning into something that was evil. And maybe his understanding of what evil was, was, uh, a, a, was referencing Nazis. It could have been Nazi monsters, Nazi monsters <laughs> or zombies, in fact, because maybe yeah. maybe the, the, that was the evil talking to him. The darkness was actually talking to him. And, and I guess if, if you're going to have any, any deliverers of, of evil, then it, it, it would be all those uh, uh, Nazi and uh, Nazi zombies just sending him a message saying this is what you are. This is what you're going to be. Um, yeah, you've got to you've got to end your life. Scene. It could it could have been a motivation for him to end his life. You know that this is what you're going to see for the rest of your uh, existence if you don't end it now. Right, right. So I, I guess you know it's it's an interpretation. I guess, but <laughs> but it's, 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 I probably it's a, would have written it. Probably would have written it different. But it, it threw me off when I saw it. It throws me off every time I see it. It's like I don't get this. There, what are they trying to say here? There are bits that throw you off in that movie, left, right, and center. I mean, he he was naked in the park and then he has to steal a coat and it, it's a woman's coat which is hilarious <laughs> and and the balloon the boy with the balloon it, it's completely you you wouldn't script it in a in a if you were told to make a, a film about a, a werewolf movie there is a lot in this movie that you wouldn't necessarily put in there yeah 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 um, absolutely but the uh the the one scene that i think is is absolutely hilarious and the, the thing that they put in there i think they must have had the most fun filming with, with the porno scenes <laughs> yeah i wondered if they did they film that stuff to use it or they just like can you buy stock porn and then just like use that that's a good question sure if... can you buy stock porn I, I i don't know i think they did it <laughs> i think they actually did film it because um i, I actually i'm pretty sure that i have seen uh, a blooper reel and um, there's John Lin- John Landis is talking in this blooper reel, but it's silent. There's no there's no sound, and he's it's as if he's explaining what's going on in American Wealth in London or the scene. And all of a sudden, the background falls down, and there are these people having sex and they're naked. <laughs> I do remember seeing that. that. The, the line was the guy bursts in the door and says. Uh, hey, you promised me you'd never do this again. And the guy says, I promise no such thing. And he says, not you, her. And she goes, I've never seen you before in my life. He goes, oh, sorry. And Walks out the door. Oh, it's it's, <laughs> it's a it's oh, a hilarious God. scene. And it, and it just basically says this is exactly what this, th- these movies are like. And, it's so oh, funny. Yeah. But <laughs> oh. it's incredible. And it's it's so funny. And it's it's not in a vampire movie it's not in a werewolf movie sorry <laughs> but there it is it's right there and i think it's right. glorious and that's what makes <laughs> american werewolf in london so unique yeah i mean you know there's there's an awful lot about the storytelling of that um uh, this movie mm-hmm. that is is so different i mean when you really start to dissect it it has it has its acts and it has the the appropriate movements you're right um, but it's one of the few uh, it's one of the few shows in which your protagonist um, is left completely unresolved right, right. And, 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 and and so so I guess perhaps in, in Jack's point of view there's resolution yeah. but in you know in his point of view uh, David's point of view there is nothing it's just ends and, and it is to date one of my favorite endings of any movie. Yes, because you don't see it coming from a mile away. You'd never see it coming, and you know if, if well, and I've done one before. But the, the next the next horror film I do, I'm going to end it very very similar. The mm-hmm. the her- heroine is going to gasp, and it's going to cut to credits. That's it. <laughs> That's it, and it, it is ambiguous. Um, whatever that moment was, and and you're right, he didn't get his resolve. But there is just that moment with that that werewolf when he looks back at her 
and the face just the the animatronics just slightly relax on the soften face, a little soften a little bit and that was all that was <laughs> needed that was all that was needed and then boom <laughs> I guess the question then becomes, did he recognize what Alex. was going on as a creature and decide to to uh, feign a lunge, let's say, feign a lunge at her knowing that he was going to be killed? I think that that must have been that uh, moment that, that Jack wanted him to have um, as a werewolf, just to realize it. and um, Because he knew he wasn't going to take his own life. I knew that Jack said that he would he wouldn't have it in him to 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 take his own life so that was the only way yeah especially with a swiss army knife and a phone booth <laughs> yeah it doesn't doesn't work very well i do i do i do love the uh the insulting the queen and um and all and calling <laughs> prince charles a, a a faggot uh all those different things it was just uh, and, but what was very odd is that all the bystanders their dialogue their lines was all very um kind of like Woody Allen background characters who just oh, kind of yeah. talk to him off screen uh, that they didn't seem to they were never real um the, the guys in the pub were the people in the hospital were but any of the innocent right, bystanders right. who were kind of just commenting about him I think he should be do you think he should be arrested no I just think he's uh, uh, you know this that and it, it just seemed very unusually um uh, kind of documentary feel about it in that in those yeah, little yeah. sides but yeah, but that's that's probably not um, not intended, and maybe they were just bit part actors who were just there for there for the day. So who knows? <laughs> I always found it interesting that the crowd. I mean, there's a couple mm. different scenes where the crowd there in Piccadilly, for example, Ooh. just they're like running towards the danger, right? And then the the <laughs> police are are spending most of their time trying to get people away. That's really awesome. there's there's some other there's some other stuff that I found really interesting, like the the. Uh, the dark player in the slaughtered lamb. You he, missed. He was a yeah, he missed. was yeah he was the first person to tell him to leave, but he was also the first person to tell him to to not go. Like we can't let them go. All right. I thought it was kind of yeah yeah. Lauren actually picked up on that. I thought oh yeah he kind of that's weird. <laughs> Why did he do that? Yeah, just try, just remembering the, the the kind of the chronology of that scene. Um, they don't hear the werewolf until after they've left, right? Right, and they wandered off the road. They're kind of wandering through the moors. So maybe uh, there's kind of like that. There's a conflict because I, I'm not too sure if that community needs to have a sacrifice or if it, if if they if they let the wolf have one, huh. then then it will go away. Um, whoever whoever the werewolf was at that time, it was somebody that they knew. Um, oh yeah, definitely. It was Stan who lived down the road, right? That's yeah. exactly it. So they knew who it was. So maybe there was a conflict as to we can get Stan back if if he attacks these people, or I, I don't know if 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 that's how it works. Because um, um, they had to kill Stan in order for him to become the werewolf. I've, it, 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 there's a few kind of blurred edges that you're not we were not too clear about as to how the the werewolf was passed on but uh but oh, yes sure. certainly and, and certainly. i'm totally fine with that kind of stuff yeah um but the idea of having him leave or wanting him to stay do you protect or do you let them go out there right. yeah that's that's definitely a conflict and it was a cool little scene i loved that whole scene you know when they first came into the to the pub there mm -hmm. um they weren't welcomed at all i mean it was very standoff ish uh <laughs> and then the whole alamo thing came up and the jokes and then it started to get warm until jack asked about the uh pentacle uh hanging on the wall or yes. I guess written on the wall not hanging on the wall that's it yeah and, <laughs> and then everything the sours whole, from there <laughs> everything cha changes and i'll tell you what I've, I've tried to tell that alamo joke so many times and i i always mess it up <laughs> Remember the Alamo? All right, then. Oh, there was this aeroplane over the Atlantic on its way to New York. And it was full of men from the United Nations. Oh, <laughs> go on, ask him. Yeah, you ask him. So halfway over the ocean, the engines run low on petrol. So they have to lighten the plane. So they heave out all the baggage, but it's still too heavy. So they chuck out all the seats, but it's still too heavy. Finally, this froggy steps up, shouts, Vive la France, and leaps out. Then an Englishman, yeah. he steps up, shouts, God save the Queen, and he leaps out. 
that the plane is still too heavy. So the Yank delegate from Texas, he steps up, shouts, remember the Alamo, and chucks out the Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the Alamo because it's it is a very funny joke. It reminds me of Hot Shots, um, Pot Dura. Oh, right. I think when they do the Geronimo, Geronimo leap me. out of the airplane. Me, <laughs> that that was when Co- I, I I remember vividly. Coca Cola came out of my nose when I saw that scene. That's hilarious. Um, but yeah, the Alamo joke I've never been able to remember until when I wanted to pull it out of the hat. Um, it's not terribly appropriate in today's world. No, but I was I was actually just talking to Melissa Burke just before you came on, and uh, we we quickly just touched upon um, the the actual actors who were in that pub uh, for American okay. Werewolf in London. There was Brian Glover, who you'd probably right. remember from Alien Three. Of course, he was the guy. Um, but there was also Rick Mail, and if you're um, a, a Britcom fan, um, you, if you know the Young Ones, Bottom, and and some of the uh, the, the British comedy. Uh, he's he's oh, one of the right, right, yes. He's he's okay. one of our most cherished uh, British comedians, um, Rick Mail. I think who else he he played? Oh, what was that crazy movie? Um, uh, I want to say I want to say Jack, but I think that's just stuck oh, in my head. Oh, I know yeah, Jack. Dead. It was around about the same. It was Drop Dead Fred. Yes, Drop, drop Dead Fred. That's the one. <laughs> <Exactly>. Yes. <laughs> So yeah. funny, and I think it was within a couple of years of Jack. So, it, and the, the font typeface of the poster maybe just bounced out the same way. Uh, but yeah, that's a crazy movie that is, and, and it's a shame because he, he. I think he died about three or four years ago. He died quite young, but um, but yeah, he was in that pub, and uh, yeah, so it was. Those were the standout points for us because that that related to who we knew in the movie very well, and of course Jenny Agatha. Um, the character that always throws me in this, though, is um, Frank Oz, Mr. Collins, the, the oh. embassy. Um, yeah. Yes. If you just close your eyes and you listen to that entire dialogue, M- it's Mr. like... Mr. Kessler, M- Mr. Kessler, please. Yes, Mr. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's like... Miss Piggy, Miss Piggy, come come on. Um, yeah. yeah. Calm down. Calm yeah, down. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to separate the voice. That's um, true. And so, but you know, th- there was there was this thing in in the eighties where you would get John Landis and Frank Oz and uh, all these other directors who would be in each other's movies. Yeah, um, it's just hilarious. It, he didn't, ex- but he didn't even try to disguise it. He just went straight in and just did his you know Frank Oz impersonation of Frank Oz I think it was it was right. very good and it worked it was a nice little cameo for him I thought it was I thought it was fantastic and he does a number of cameos I loved his cameo in Spies Like Us <laughs> just so funny and uh so but back to Jenny Agatha come on I mean uh. wow um she was she she played the local girl uh, um, local girl no, local nurse in in the hospital and right. there's that 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 really cute scene when they're buying stuff in the supermarket and uh, this kind of <laughs> thing blossoms between the two of them it's, it's yeah it's um she, she she was perfect for that part um, she kind of de- she did a good representation of of um, of a of an English woman uh, definitely. What do you mean by representation? Just I, like... Well, it, it could have gone so many of a, of a, of a cliched ways, but she had a mm. she had a, a something that was different. It was it was a nice. It wasn't too mumsy or too. Uh, she was kind of down and down to earth. It wasn't uh, there wasn't any caricature in there of a British woman. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Which which I kind of felt was 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 nice to see because. Um, some of them try too hard, and I think that a lot of actors and actresses who go to America, they tend to, they tend they tend to lean towards a nuance of of a British person that mm-hmm. is more sophisticated than what we actually are used to seeing right. on our day to day soap actress television screens. Okay, yeah, that makes total that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm glad that she she was in that role because she 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 did something different. And she she wasn't typical, and that was that was nice to well, see. Well, 
it was basic. I mean, it was a real basic character, but it was also a very caring character. I mean, you could tell yeah. that she was in some way felt like she was, you know, rescuing a puppy she had found on the street. That's it. <laughs> I'll get it. <clears throat> Hello. Alec, have you heard anything? He's here. Is he all right? Why didn't you call me? Where was he? He doesn't remember. He woke up at the uh, zoo. The zoo? Is he rational? Yes, he is. He's very excited and confused, but uh, he's not crazy, if that's what you mean. Have you read the papers today? We listen to the radio or the television. No, why? Is David behaving strangely? Uh, uh, no, he's uh, he's not really. Uh, he's rather enthusiastic. Now, could you get here without any trouble? Yes, I should think so. I want you to bring David here straight away. I want him in my care. I'll notify the police that we found him, but it's imperative. You bring him straight to the hospital, you understand? Yes, Doctor. Now, you're certain he's lucid. You won't need any help. No, he's fine. Um, we'll come right over. There's a, there's a few <laughs> unusual set pieces in American Werewolf in London that, that kind of get cut away to that I remember watching. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the Disney memorabilia. In, yeah, the Mickey Mouse... And, and and they're very unusual cutaways because there's one cutaway during the, the actual werewolf transformation. What is your thought on on that? Why why did they need to cut away? I don't know. Well, if you Jack remember. first. Picked, yeah, Jack first picked it up and and used it to say, you know, hi, David, in the middle of the night. <laughs> yes. Um. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was just harkening back to. Oh, you know what it was? I'll bet it was a, an I told you so. Because that was his first transformation, and Jack, it was the first time that, uh, well, not the first time, but the, <gasps> he, Jack used it to say hello and made a big deal about picking up the Mickey Mouse. I'll bet it was a almost an I told you so. Yes, that was Jack projecting through Mickey Mouse during, <laughs> do you know, uh, I love that. I've, I've never heard an interpretation like that, and I think that's golden. That's perfect. I had to think about that one for a second. I, I mean, I, I, mm. I, I always thought the cut was, you know... Unusual, weird, and I, I, I knew the, I knew the sim, symbol, I knew the, I knew why it was there, but I never really give gave it any thought. Because as soon as you <laughs> see Mickey Mouse, you think Jack, because it's yeah, hardening exactly. back, it's a callback, and that's that's exactly what we needed to do. We needed to hear that. I told you so. And yeah, that oh, that's unreal. That's great. See, this is this, this is why we needed to have this conversation. I feel as though that <laughs> all my answers for American Wealth in London have now been answered. Uh, I can't think of any other um, specific cutaways that I found distracting. No, I can't think either. Because um, they weren't really into um, product placement back then. Um, so I, mm, I, I, I'm no. pretty sure that the Disney thing was nothing to do with that because they, they didn't make anything with that, I'm sure. Um, now, I can't remember if it was before or after that David went on to do the Dr. Pepper ads. It was it might have been after. I'm not sure. My timeline's all messed up when I was that young. That's, yeah, I, I think I remember reading this again, and I think it was after because that was what David Landis, uh, John, sorry, John Landis, um, hired him based on those Dr Pepper commercials. Right, right, singing and dancing sort of. I mean, he yeah. was a singer to begin with. Yeah, <laughs> which is yeah, which is very different and and, and a surprising role for him to take on. Um, and Gr Griffin was uh, I, I don't know what he'd done before that. I know he did, um, um, was it After Midnight or something? Mm -hmm. Was that a Scorsese picture that was afterwards? I don't recall. But, yeah, um, I can't remember the title, the title of that one, but it was a, quite well known. But I don't remember him ever doing anything else but those two movies. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I never didn't follow his career after that. I did yeah. wonder... I did wonder the the zoo scene, <laughs> what what led him to? I mean, I'd, I'd hate for it just to be a simple cliche answer, but what led him to the wolf's den that he obviously broke into because he had to break out that ceiling panel. That's it, yes. To, to get into, um, but was it just like was it something kind of simple like I just want to be with my kind or? I mean, let's not let's not let's not overanalyze it. I mean, there are a lot of cliches in this film. A lot. I mean, the pentangle is just a cliche that was never mm -hmm. really explained at all. Um, no. But I wondered about that one. I wondered why. Well, a couple things. I wondered why 
the um, the the wolves didn't bug him when the little dog bugged him with the two little girls. The little dog was barking at him like ferociously. True, yeah, because they didn't smell, they didn't sniff out anything different. They were accepting right. of him. Hmm. That's interesting yeah. because then now you're kind of thinking that that uh, that animal, the animal kingdom is kind of in on this this uh, this thing. I don't know that they or kind sensed of, it or didn't sense it. Yeah, I don't know. It was weird. I just I kind of I I kind of liked it. Oh yes, of course you would end up with the wolves. <laughs> yeah, of course it does that. Yeah, and then maybe <laughs> there's that crocodile Dundee thing. Where the the actual idea that that he is like the alpha, um, because he is both werewolf and man, that mm. uh, in their present they're all very passive. There was okay. there was no aggravation from any of them. But the, with the dog, um, the dog is a messenger from Satan. The dog is used as a as a messenger. So who? Oh, I, I'm I'm making this up as I go along. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I think I'm reaching a lot there. But I'm, I, I guess there has to be something because I, I don't think that any of those animals, apart from the dog, were reacting to him. Even the cat. No. Was, I think there was a cat yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, a cat on the ledge when he was trying to break back into the That's break it. back into the into the house. So um, oh. Griffin went on to be a producer and director, by the way. Sorry. Oh, oh yes, yes he did. So he didn't yeah. really start, do a lot of. Uh, in front of the camera, really? No, not much after that. I mean, most notably, at least yeah. the one that I remember mostly would be uh, Practical Magic. Ah. With uh, Sandra Bullock um, directed that. Ah, oh, right, yes. Yes, I, re- I remember that one. Nicole Kidman, and yeah. Right, right, Nicole Kidman, yeah. Okay. Show. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think I'll also have a look at his filmography and see what else he's done, because, you know, mm. it's always interesting to see... Um, you know where these actors get their inspiration from after working on all these films um, yeah and it's, i noticed that it's funny you know you mentioned that because when i see the makeup in american werewolf in london i recognize rick baker's style yes i i, I recognize that this is going to sound weird but i recognize it mostly in the teeth <laughs> the True. teeth of the, of the creatures he creates that's true i guess so yeah um because a lot of them are quite uh, there's a lot of attention to, to detail. It's usually quite a focal point. Yeah, yeah, they're very teethy. Very teethy, and then the tilted head, <laughs> tilted back, and yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, and all that. The, the snout is very pronounced. Um, okay, I'm, I'm thinking, did he do Company of Wolves? No, I don't think he did. I don't think so. No, no I'm thinking too far behind, aren't I? I'm too far back. Yeah. yeah. But, Funny, uh, interesting story. Um, because Disney Corporation. Um, Whenever they won an Oscar, that Oscar went to Walt Disney. Yes. Um, he has more Academy Awards than anybody. The only person who has um, more than uh, as an individual is actually Rick Baker That's uh, for the work he's done over the years. He's got like 12 or something like that. It's ridiculous. And I think I always, I always remember seeing him um, at the Oscars and recognizing him because of his uh, – he's got such a strong dress sense. Um, <laughs> the silver locks, the silver locks, and the, yeah, and it was yeah. It's always I, I kind of always felt comforting, comforted when he won, um, and it was it was just nice to watch. Uh, to, to like see all him. is right in the universe. Like yes, of course, I feel better now. Yeah, good for him. I'm glad he's still exactly. doing it. I'm, sta- I'm glad he's, exactly. he's standing up to the to the standards of to, of today, and uh, and it keeps succeeding. It yeah, so. <laughs> The CG man's not but, keeping him down. No, exactly. I don't think he can. <laughs> and that, that's that's exciting. That's good. That's that's keeping people inspired. I really wish, you know, I, I look at horror films today, and I watch a few of them. Uh, um, oh, I watch as many as I can, but very few of them um, have the kind of pull for me that a lot of the horror films of the 80s did or do still i mm-hmm. and i'm not sure if it's nostalgia or or if i'm just being overly critical of you know today's horror films but they always feel shallow to me they feel like just a bloodbath scene one bloodbath scene after another yeah yeah um i, have I, a, I felt like watching partner, um, i felt like watching um uh, Mar- have you ever seen the film martyrs I've not, no. Because that, that to me was just like that. It was very beautifully shot, amazing cinematography, um, 
it was beautifully done, but it was purely just about ripping flesh off the body. And it was, and, and I can imagine the skill. It was practical. I'm sure of it. A lot of it was practical, but, uh, but it was just too much. It was too much. And it kind of, it kind of pulled you away from the idea of, of it being, um, an enjoyable entertainment and more about the, um, I don't know the the cruel nature of the the sadistic nature of it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it the, doesn't the grim, feel right. A grimace, just just simply a grimace is not a story. You've you've got yeah. to tell the story, even exactly. if even if it's a even if even if it's violent, even if it's horrible things are happening, it still has has got to be a story. And it's unfortunate. And you know, I was I was talking to a, uh, my business partner a couple weeks ago, and he said mm. he said he was really frustrated right now because Hollywood is basically a bad cover band for the 80s and it just just regurgitating the same thing in a yeah. really really bad way over and over again and there's not much creativity and my hope and, and kind of my fear at the same time mm. is that they'll try and redo this film um, much like much like other films that are being redone yeah. right now and just you know sometimes you just have to leave if it's not broke, don't fix it. Leave it alone. Exactly. And I think with American <laughs> Werewolf, it, it's one of those films. Don't Look Now is another one of those those films that mm. you you cannot you cannot do anything with that. It was it was filmed by a master. Um, don't have one of your um, I, and, and I, I can see this happening a lot. If, if there's an independent filmmaker who's made an amazing short film or an amazing film, feature film. Um, with a very low budget, they automatically they get given the next Godzilla movie, and <laughs> and it, and I just think that that's it's not fair on. It's nice for them to have the big money, the big check coming in, but I kind of right. feel as though I, I would personally want to see more of, of of the independent films that he was making, and and to stick with that original idea that he, of 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 different films instead of just jumping into a blockbuster. It's it's a shame. Yeah, you know, and and every every executive at the studio level has to make a decision based mm. on what they think will turn a profit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the the riskier you go, the more likely you are to lose your job, or lose you know yeah. millions and millions of dollars. Lose a lot, <laughs> and, and, and I can understand that. But I think that the the idea, uh, I think risk is a part of the game, and mm. I think that they're they're relying so much now on, on sequels on, um, on franchise and on reboots and remakes and soft reboots, you name it, that they, they've, they've got no fear that they, they, they're kind of like trying to guarantee so much. And yet they're, they're miss. I feel as though they're missing the point because so why, mm. why, why have all, all of the films that you could have chosen from, mm -hmm. um, why American werewolf in London? For this topic. For this topic. It's just one of those films that I've always watched it every single year religiously. And I think it was one of the first films that I saw as a kid that I shouldn't have seen. And I feel as though it's at the very core of the, of the reason why I love the behind the scenes part of film making. Hmm. I think it was at my, at my very source of why I love film. That's super cool. Purely. It holds a yeah. special place in your heart. Very much so. And, um, and like you said, there's a lot of 80s nostalgia, and there has been a couple of good horror films recently that are kind of more psychological films. I think It, it Follows was very stylistically effective. And uh, right. I don't know if you've seen Starry Eyes. Oh, I've not seen that one, no. Yeah, I think, it, yeah, I think it's one of those films that um, it, it has that 80s nostalgia, but it also mm -hmm. has a very strong sense... Oh, I don't. I, I can't really put my finger on it. It had this very strong sense of of the psychological underpinnings of an other wannabe actress in Hollywood who gets pulled into a dark cult society. And but the change that she goes through, it, it's it's astonishing. And I think it's it's definitely worth watching. Um, Starry Eyes. It, it is it is a small budget movie. It, it didn't have a very big distribution. And luckily, it came out on DVD, and it just it just caught my attention, and I I've, I I love that film a lot. It's very effective, probably I worth will watching. Put that one on the list, yeah. Please do. Starry Eyes, and uh, 
Yeah, but but out of all of them, it it seems to be there's there's probably two or three every decade that stick out now. Yeah, I think that's a good count. I, I would agree. the The last one that I really really enjoyed mm-hmm. was probably the others. Uh, another Nicole Kidman. Yes, that was um, very effective. Very effective. Yeah. It, it did it did a, a nice job um and then probably second from that would be um lady in black oh. um which is I, I had an opportunity to see that on stage when i was there uh in london in the theater district and uh, it was good it was a it was a good it was a good play and it, i thought it was a really good uh, theatrical adaptation the second one really just stunk but <laughs> the yeah that was another one but i you know I, and i harken back my my one true horror love has been Halloween, and, and it always, always will always be. Will be yeah. And much like you, you know, you watch you watch American Werewolf in London religiously. I watch the Halloween series uh, religiously every year. Um, it's it was it was the first movie set I ever set foot on was Halloween Five. Oh uh, wow! When I was a, a young kid. It's great. <laughs> exactly. Glorious film. <laughs> we, we, I, I, there's a whole psychological aspect to why we love horror films like we do. We do, and, and why we latch onto certain films. Um, that's very true. And it's funny because when I, when I think about the others, you mentioned that Nicole Kidman mm. movie. Um, that 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 is a kind of a, a, a distant connection to the Innocence. I don't know if you remember that black mm. and white. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very similar. And I think it's what I think you're probably going to see what I'm touching upon here uh, is that that children in in horror films um, very effective in in the early days. You know, oh, yeah. you, you these actors that they chose for these films were astonishing. You know, you, Heather O'Rourke for the Poltergeist movies, uh, right. the Kids in Innocence, and on the Omen, all of these films that that the children were terrifying and and. It seems as though that nowadays that they're, they're trying really hard to recapture that, but I don't think you can ever beat um, the, the the child actors that they had back in the day. Um, I mean, you, you well, Linda Blair yeah, for The Exorcist was just... astonishing, <laughs> right? Astonishing. Well, and there was the whole Children of the Corn series played on that pretty heavily. Yes, yes. It was just spooky, but there's something really creepy about uh, the the innocence being uh, tainted, right? Or, or perhaps the the innocence of a child yeah. being uh, a, a trap. <laughs> And the one film that managed to do that recently was The Babadook. Um, oh, right, right, right. And I think that the biggest thing about that film is that it's more to do with the adult being afraid of the child. That it's that, that idea of, of an adult being afraid of, of the innocent. That, that disturbs me the most, I think. We, we pulled off the uh, the whole hour there. It's brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye and a blink. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Bye bye. 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 Wow, what can I say about that one? That was Denver Robbins. Enjoyed that, right? There's lots lots going on there, and uh, we were able to pick that movie apart. And do you know what? It was amazing. I never thought that I'd find new things to talk about when it came to American Werewolf in London. Uh, but Denver pulled it right out, pulled it right out there. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to uh, to do this talk. I, I found out a little bit more about Denver. I did not know about his father um, being so, so well connected, I guess, um, is, is for, for a better term of phrase. But it's that kind of inspiration that, that propels you forward. And if you are interested in special effects makeup, then just just get the books. Don't just stare at the internet. Don't just stare at DVDs. Just pick up a book because you never know. It, it might be those images that will grab you and, and take you to the next level. You can find Denver Robbins. And now I, be- I believe I have the website already queued up. Here we go. Um, Denver Robbins operates in Utah under thebrutesquad.com. That is thebrutesquad.com. Um, so you can find him there. You can also find him on Facebook, Twitter, Vine, 
Oh, so not not Vine. Vine is obsolete now. We're looking at Vimeo. Vimeo is where you can find Denver. Don't don't look for him on Vine. Um, Denver is about true content, and um, his website is also incredible. Um, I'm I'm very envious. I'd like to kind of um, I'd like to work on something like this. This is beautiful. The imagery in this website, the the close-ups. Is that a wow? You have no idea what I'm looking at, but it is beautiful. So go to the Brute Squad, hire him, because you know what? If if you have anything that you need to get made, Denver Robbins will will never let you down. I am absolutely sure of that. He's he's got it, man. This this guy. I'm just gonna sit here anyway. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say goodbye to you and uh, let you be on your very merry way. <laughs> If you didn't already listen to it, there is the Melissa uh, Burke podcast where we talk about film. And um, also following this one is Brian Byers, who, um, who is a dear friend and also one of the most creative, prolific people I've met or haven't met yet. Actually, we've never actually been in contact. I've met Denver. I haven't met Melissa, but I have and I haven't met Brian. This is... This is an injustice to the world. The world could not be bigger. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, Melissa Burke's on the previous podcast, and the one after this is Brian Byers. So please, stay tuned. Enjoy your Halloween. Be good. Um, I care about you all deeply and equally. So just take care of yourself. And go watch American Werewolf in London. That's all I ask. Have an open mind. Bag it up, people.